<coughs> the other thing, because I live in North County, and this is a sore spot with a lot of African Americans that live in this area that have college, edu college educated, good jobs, so on and so forth. Why is everything going to Chesterfield and stuff like that? Well, that's because well, that's where the disposable income is, honey, and businesses are going to flock to that. But what has happened to my area? I've had, you know, the car, the car industry uh, went to pot. All those jobs where working class folks were earning those middle class wages dissipated. When they dissipated, then my business got hurt as a construction business. So it's very important as you pull all these things and you tie them together, you know, we need to have, you gotta have workers that have good wages. I'm very concerned with what Tim said that as a legislature, you're not passing tax incentives that could have kept the data centers here because that Google job is huge and we have had members, good electricians that should probably be working for me helping bring tax, more tax money here instead of just coming back at home on the weekend spending the money. Uh, that should be a big data center built here. It makes no sense whatsoever that's not in Missouri, let alone on this side, on my side of the state, in the center of the state, wherever you got it, the infrastructure is here and as a result now we're going to have those jobs go away to people that su uh, support that. Um, so I think I've uh, tied that up, tie everything up here and say that adversely, I think this could affect minorities. Um, since minorities probably aren't gonna necessarily have a seat on the table here, I gotta make sure that that is definitely stated. Uh, one other point with Lieutenant Governor's, uh, the Lieutenant Governor uh, Kinder uh, made. Uh, number one, he talked about that Missouri used to be uh, what, first in shoes, first in booze, and something else? Last in American. Last in American League. Okay, well, the Browns are wrong when I was born. But, um, you know, it's funny how a lot of different things kind of tie together. My grandmother uh, used to, I remember I used to always get, when I was a little kid, I always used to get these little clip-on ties. And uh, she'd always have one for me, uh, and stuff like that. And even when, when I was in high school in Miami Vice, and they had those little Thin ties. I used to be able to get a bunch of them anytime I want and wear paisleys and stuff like that. So it was pretty cool. Um, well, she, my, that's on my father's side. She was able to buy a little small home in the Pine Lawn area. At that time, that was still middle class, and we can go on a bunch of different history with that. However, my other grandmother on my maternal side, both of deceased, ceased on. She, the best that she was able to, the job she was able to get was as a domestic uh, housekeeper. And that side of my family never got out of Pruitt Igo until they probably tore it down. The other side didn't. So, you know, and it, you know, as a minority, I've, as I watch history, I've seen that the, the Caucasian side really benefited from the union the unions being able to give them a good middle class wage so that they were able to help the generations that have proceeded after them so they could go to college and do many things with their, their children and their grandchildren. African Americans, because of the Jim Crow laws, civil rights, everything pre-1964, we didn't have the opportunity just to get those jobs. It, it could have been union, it could have been non-union, because Lord knows in Mississippi it was hell that my grandmother didn't even let my father visit his father in Mississippi because she was scared to death that something was going to happen to him. So now all the laws have changed, things have flipped around, and it's like, okay, now we have this opportunity, and I feel it's like it's an assault that, that people in my generation before me and after me, in my basically in my age group really is what you're talking about, aren't going to have an opportunity to be able to earn in a middle class living. Now it's a lot of different dynamics, everything else, but I think that really, you really need to think about that. St. Louis, Missouri has gotten hell with what happened over the past few months. And they talk about the unemployment, the unemployment, the unemployment. We can talk about the education system. I want to know what the heck you're going to do about that because all that drives in. Businesses look for educated workforce, a little bit of diverse workforce too because they, they got to have people buy their stuff. Everybody's got to buy it. You know, people got to pay their electric bill. 
you know, so take all of that into consideration in what you're doing, because that affects my business. It also affects my community. Everybody around here, what side of this you're on, it, really, it truly does do that. So um, I would thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd like to remind the committee that inquiries are welcome, but we've had enough speeches today. Uh, Representative Bratton? To inquire briefly. Go ahead. Gentlemen, uh, you said you were uh, Representative Bratton. Hi, how you doing? Where are you from? Uh, from Cass County, south of Kansas City. Okay. So I'm, I'm a fellow business owner and uh, construction contractor as well. Sure. Now, say this were to pass and become the law of the land, and how many employees do you do you currently uh, employ, just roughly? I currently, currently right now, uh, I have 17 electricians. We've uh, blown up as much as 40. Yes, sir. So, if this were to pass and say half of your employees were to opt out of being a, a union member, would you as a business owner cut their pay and, and uh, uh, refuse to pay them what they're, what they're worth? Or do you think that you would continue to pay them because you know they put out good product, they're, they're trained, and they, put, they know what they're doing? Would you, would you stop as a business owner paying them a, a just wage uh, well, because you weren't forced to? Well, no, I would not stop paying them a just wage. Um, I guess what I'm you, saying are you is saying, as like, a oh, because I can pay you $10 an hour, I'm going to go pay you $10 an right. hour. You would not do that because that would not be right, correct? So I mean, no, no, I don't think that's morally, I don't think that morally that would be right. I mean, that of course, the flip side of that coin is, well, then they have the right to go seek if they can find somebody who's going to pay them more. Right. They would have that option to yes, do sir. that, but... but to, to think that, that you as a business owner are going to all of a sudden start undercutting a, a person that, that does good work, puts out a good product, mm -hmm. I think that's disingenuous to say that, that you have to be a union member in order to, to seek and, and receive a just wage. I pay a very high price and I'm not required to. I do because I know they put out a great product and they're very high skilled and, and they give me more work and they, they help pay my bills because of the work put out that they do. Uh, so that's why I, I guess I, I don't see, uh, by, by passing something like this, it, it, it kills your, your job market or, or the union member's job market. Representative, can I touch upon that? One of the things you have in the construction industry is multi-employer Taft-Hartley funds. So his competition, those other 225 electrical contractors, all pay into the same health and welfare fund. They all pay into the, the same training fund. They all pay into the annuity and the 401k funds. So these contractors choose to be union so that they can participate with that workforce that's trained through that collective bargaining agreement. What the legislation says is where the employers are coming from is you're taking away my right to ask my employees to be union only and signatory to the um, union, the IBEW, because for a hundred years with the laws the way they are, we have created these multi-employer Taft-Hartley funds and you're eliminating our current business plan of how we operate. So it's kind of really a neat setup these contractors and unions have set up over the last 50 years that you have competition all sitting at the table making sure they're paying their employees the same so that they can go off and bid. Now an employer can be non-union and not have to pay those. Our argument to this legislation is, is you're taking away the right of the employer to have this union only security clause. So that's how we're coming at the argument on this issue. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. to inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Senator. Representative, this might be, question might be for you probably. Uh, the letter that you presented us from the uh, NECA, yes, from Mr. Martin, the vice, executive vice president. Yes, sir. In the last two paragraphs, I was I was I was kind of interested in the way this the way this read. It said that um, our members are frequently hired to perform complex construction projects in right to work states because we've developed productive workers with superior skills by working cooperatively with, with our union counterparts. 
And that would go along with some of the testimony we've heard from some of your, your counterparts there. But in the very next paragraph, Mr. Martin says, Missouri's economy is extremely distressed. Our industry has been especially hard hit with record unemployment levels, shortages of construction opportunities, and difficulties securing adequate financing. It appears to me like, just reading these two paragraphs, the works in the right to work states, even your own company, your, your own companies, your own association, are going to the right to work states for work, because it's not in Missouri. That ought to be another reason that we should take a look at, at bringing right to work to Missouri. Would you not agree? That, that's a valid comment. Let me throw a comment back at you. In Saks Electric, one of the larger signatory contractors in St. Louis, is working at the Google plant. I was driving to take my son to college four or five years ago and I drive down 55 through Mississippi and I see this huge new car plant. It's like, wow, we're losing car plants. You are. Then I go down one time, go down 65, and there's another huge car plant in another right to work state. So I start researching, why are these businesses leaving? Well, the Hondo, Hondo plant in Mississippi received about $540 million in tax subsidies. That other car plant received over $400 million in tax subsidies. So what my debate with you today is, is we're all for Missouri's economy growing in what market is new out there that we can bring in. And we've seen through legislation, the action of the legislature, by giving these corporations these incentives, if you incentivize, they will come. And all I'm saying is that location up there, they were looking in Boone County four years ago, is one of the locations instead of Omaha or Iowa. And those were two right to work. So they liked where Boone County located. They liked the idea that Boone County had a university on the camp on, in the area to educate their workforce. They enjoyed the infrastructure right to work wasn't brought up it's okay states how much and we see that yearly because every economic development bill businesses come in and say how much you've seen that with boeing they told seattle we're leaving you had all those states competing and all those states legislatures were meeting to compete and that's all i'm saying with our testimony is it's those four things infrastructure education electric rates and how much can you incentivize me? Capitalism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. We do need to move on. I thank you for thank the you time, time. God bless you. Chairman. This gentleman, for the second time. We, we need to move on, please. Second on. Uh, Mr. McCarty with Associated Industries. I need some union representation so I can get recognized. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, members of the committee, Ray McCarty, President of Associated Industries in Missouri, here to testify on both bills in favor. Um, we have had a long-standing policy in support of the right to work provisions, and uh, as the previous witness said, those are very important things to businesses when they are looking to locate a business. Of course, labor um, is a very important component. The availability of an educated workforce is important. Um, but one of the things that is on those site locators that you heard about in the opening testimony, one of the things that's on their checklist is right to work. And often, as you heard, if you don't have uh, that on your checklist for the state, then you're passed over and you're not even you don't even receive any secondary consideration. We think um, that's the real value in providing this right to work uh, in Missouri is that you make the second round of discussion. And we think if we get to that level, we have a good state and we're able to compete on the other issues. Um, so that's the real value in it. I don't want to provide lengthy testimony because I know you're running behind, but that's, we're in support of it. You have to answer the questions. Andy Weber. Quiet, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. I, I'm a little bit late. Did you get a chance to see the signs that Lieutenant Governor Kinder had up? I saw one of them. I was standing where Did you see? Yeah. You couldn't see this I one over here? One. Okay, it was really interesting. Uh, it said, well, do you, know, you know what the age of majority is? To be an adult? Right. In, in Missouri, it's what, 18? 18, right. Okay, and so that, that sign uh, 
said that there was a drop in employment um, between 16 and 19 year olds, which is predominantly children, right? I mean, it is. So he's agreed to be very factual. I think we did answer the question of a previous witness. I can't answer that. So, but it, would you interpret that sign to mean that the argument for right to work is that we have less children working in Missouri today? No, I, w I wouldn't say. That's what the sign said, there was less children working in Missouri. I didn't get to see the sign work. Okay, then you saw, you saw the sign over here, though, right? I did see that one. Okay, and would you, what did it say, do you remember? I don't remember. It was something about... It wasn't very memorable testimony. I didn't see that. <laughs> It, well, it said, I think it said, well, it said, I think it said, uh, yeah. poverty up, uh, income down. income down. And I was going to ask, do you know what, what percentage of the state is, is in the private sector employees are, are in the union? Are union I think 8%. Right. It's about 8%. It's dropped 8%. Yeah, it, exactly. It's dropped. So what we made over the time, over the long time trend, it's, den it's, we agree that th there's a drop. Yeah, that's what I long time. I've noted, yes. Right. So that sign would have been equally accurate if it had said poverty up, unionism down, too. That would have been equally accurate, wouldn't it have? Union, yeah, union membership has dropped, so. Right, so we could have changed that sign to say poverty up, union membership down, and that would have been inaccurate. You said it. Do you have any thoughts of your own, or no? No, actually, I do. I'm okay, so do you think that that would be inaccurate? If you, if you allow, um, you know, workers to choose whether they want to be in the union or not, I don't see any harm in that. And I think, uh, you know, the fact that unions are there, they do provide a good service in a lot of areas. I think providing training is, as we've heard before, is a good service. I think providing benefits, you know, are attractive to a lot of workers. And I think if workers see those as great values, they will participate in unions, but for those who don't want to participate, they don't. They should not have to. And, and I think that's, that's that, a real question. Ninety-two percent of the job, private sector jobs, they don't. Right. So there's that clearly a huge amount of choice there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to hear from Mr. Mike Lewis. Mike, I'll bet you thought going third was going to get you out in a hurry. I also bet on the Seahawks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Mike Lewis, Seattle Public Radio. Uh, I think you have a booklet in front of you. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. You have a booklet in front of you um, with clear cover marked up by the Missouri AFL CIO. I'm just going to briefly go through that and then go to a couple talking points and, and I'll try to wrap up. Um, one of the issues that's been talked about early on in this hearing today was the, uh, the uh, fatalities and um, <clears throat> problems with safety in, uh, in non-right and right to work states. And um, the, all these are, uh, and, and when you go through this, you'll notice that these are done by universities and and the, and the material all is marked as to where the statistics come from. But in non-right to work states, industry fatalities are one, one fourth of a person per thousand workers. With lo and that's, that's with low levels of union density. But the estimate drops all the way down to one, uh, uh, six, 0 0.16 people per thousand when there's high union density. In non-right to work states, the uh, construction occupation fatality rates with low union density double those with high union density, estimated at, uh, tw again, at a quarter um, of a person per thousand compared to a tenth in the other ones. In the right to work states, the range is between 0.18 and 0.04 and per thousand for low and high union densities, respectively. It, that, that's huge. I mean, I mean, when you think about one fourth of a person for every thousand workers in a state uh, is at risk, or you can only have one tenth of a person at risk, it, it's something that really should be considered. And, and I, I heard the comments about OSHA. Um, the problem is with the transition of whistleblower laws and how much trouble you get in now if you uh, call and rat out your employer for being a rat employer. Um, you can get in. Um, there's 
there's been a lot of talk today about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, African American and minority workers. Mm -hmm. the, the second or third, the second section of that book um, talks about exactly that. And, and one of the one of the biggest things that stood out to me that says uh, on in, in Table One that's in that book that uh, on average unionized black workers do substantially better than their non-union counterparts. From 2018 to 2013, black workers in a union earned on average about 27% per hour more than black workers who were not in a union. You're, you're taking away more rights from people who don't, who can't make it on their own. The, their ability to get training through a union shop, whether it's in the construction industry, whether it's through a privatization of a factory, whatever it is, um, those, that ability decreases. And the question was asked of uh, the business owner who was up here before me, if he would cut his wages because right to work passed. And, and I was glad to hear that he said no. But there are many unions who, if they continue to exist in certain industries, those employers, be it ethical or non-ethical, are going to cut wages and benefits. Um, the comments I'd like to make have all come from questions of other individuals. I want to talk about what the union security clause. The uh, sponsor of the bill said that the union security clause um, is what's wrong, that they should not have to belong, and, and that's what makes them belong. Well, there's a couple things with that. The National Labor Relations Board has determined that a union security clause is a um, mandatory subject of bargaining, that the union and the company have to agree to bargain that clause every single time that contract expires. The employer can say, I don't want it in here anymore, and they have to bargain about it. It can go away. And yet, time after time after time, it's, it's unimportant to these employers because they know that they, are, they don't want a situation in their shop where I don't pay dues, but the guy next to me does, but the same guy has to represent both of us equal and fairly. And I know that was kind of blown off today by the sponsor of the bill too. It's totally not true. You do have to represent them as a labor organization just as wholeheartedly as you have to support the ones who don't. And when you're already talking about cutting wages by two bucks in a, in a right to work state whose average is $2 an hour less than ours, what do you think are the first things that are going to be going away that they can't afford to pay anymore? If I'm making $80 a week less, there's a baby formula, diapers, think I'm going to quit buying that stuff? I'm going to quit paying my union dues, probably. But then my union's going to get weaker, and it's just going to become a vicious triangle. You're taking away the right of the employer to do that, to negotiate what is a mandatory subject of bargaining anyway, you're taking away his right to negotiate in the agreement whatever he wants to. There was talk about all the jobs in the city of St. Louis. Well, let me tell you something. I, I'm, my family's been from St. Louis. Um, I think I'm about seventh generation. And a lot of them worked in um, commerce, transportation of goods the river, the highways. But now we've gone global. You don't put things on a barge going up and down the Mississippi River when you've gone global. you got to have an airport. There was an opportunity to create the China Hub in St. Louis. It was refused. The legislature here did that. Some of you had good reasons, I assume, but that killed St. Louis once again because that is a city that was built on trade and commerce. And if we're going to complete, compete in a global world, we have to get it there by air, or it's not going. One other, and I don't want anybody to take this personally, I just thought this was kind of funny, that we had 16 seats in, in Congress, and we had a 
you know, anybody know how many state representatives we had when we had 16? 163. Now we got eight. We still got 163. So, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing personal to anybody. All right. The shoe factories and the hat factories, and, the, and this point's been made over and over, a big part of St. Louis. How many people have shoes made in America on right now? Yeah, and how many don't? You, you, that is huge. People just, because you, and it's not, it's not really your own fault. You can't find them here. It's got nothing to do with fighting against Oklahoma, Iowa, Kansas, the surrounding states. It's fighting against, it's a, a race to the bottom, is what it's been called. And that's exactly what what right to work is, just like a trade agreement. So, the other point, Mr. Chairman, is that many members will testify today. I think I might be the only one. Um, no disrespect to uh, Lieutenant Governor Kinder, but his statement that the union bosses had, are the ones who have it all to lose. This room back here isn't union bosses. These are the faces of your constituents and they're here because they believe that their union gives them the ability to raise their family that's why they're here so with that mr chairman that ends my comments and i'll be happy to take any questions thank you sir are there questions thank you very much thank you mr chairman and members of the Jay Atkins. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jay Atkins. I'm general counsel for the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It is a pleasure to be in front of this committee again. I will keep my testimony brief. We have heard this, uh, uh, if not this particular, these particular bills, this particular issue. Uh, a number of years in a row now. I'm not sure that I can add a whole lot to the discussion at this point other than to say on behalf of the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and our uh, nearly 3,500 member companies and all their employees, um, this issue is uh, a priority for us. It has been for a number of years. It remains so. And I would urge uh, this committee and this body as a whole to finally take this um, uh, take this issue up and pass it and move forward. I think that those uh, uh, unions, um, I, I think the good unions will thrive under a um, right to work framework and I think that um, those that are perhaps anachronistic in their uh, utility are going to fall by the wayside and I think that's going to make our state stronger. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, sir. Representative Smith. To inquire, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. All right, how you doing? Very well, Representative Smith. How's your foot? Oh, it's getting better. Yeah. Good thing I got that good insurance. Good thing. <laughs> My union contract. <laughs> I was able to get that. Oh, um, uh, probably better than mine. Hey, yeah. <laughs> you should think about it. Um, uh, it has its privileges. Membership has its privileges. Membership has its privileges. I, I know where I can go now. Um, so you all have members with the Missouri Chamber, right? We do. And they get benefits, right, for being part of the Chamber, correct? Well, they get the benefit of my presence here today, so... Which is awesome. <laughs> then there's other uh, uh, employers who choose not to be part of the Chamber. Absolutely. But they don't get that benefit. No, they do not. Okay, so in my union, which is the machinist, if someone says, hey, this goes through and they don't want to be part of my labor organization, they still get that benefit. It, it, it's, it's not right. Would you agree? Well, I would, I would agree that, that that scenario is, is, yes, I would agree that they still get representative, represented even if, if they don't play. And they still get the right. wage increases that I get. They still get that good insurance that's right. taking care of my sports injury. Right. And I, and, I th <laughs> and I think we've been down uh, this, this road uh, before in previous years when, when we've discussed it. And I, I suppose I would say the flip side of that coin is what, what one person refers to as a free rider, another might refer to as a captive passenger. That is to say, if there's a company in this state that uh, does not find any value in joining the Chamber of Commerce because they think they can uh, 
do a better job on their own, they're free to do that. They can come to Jeffrey. We're a lobbying organization. We lobby on behalf of our members. There might be companies out there that think they can lobby better on their own. They can hire lobbyists of their own. They can employ a lobbyist of their own. They can come down here and they can uh, take their shot at creating law in this state. Sometimes it will be successful. Sometimes they won't. And I think that is true also in the union setting. If you, uh, if there is no um, captive passenger scenario, then um, if I'm a man who works the high steel, maybe I'm the maybe I'm the best rivet driver that this country has ever seen, and I am in high demand because it takes, you know, brass huevos the size of coconuts to work the high steel. Like everybody recognizes that. Right. And if I'm that good at what I do, I ought to be free to go out and force somebody to pay me top dollar. Now, now I, I know we can go back, and this is this is probably fact. If we look at bills that were supported by the chamber, which companies came together because they saw a reason to collectively bargain, mm -hmm. uh, they saw a reason to come together, get the chamber going. I actually understand the chamber. If I was uh, in the one percent, I wanted to make get up into that point one percent. You know, I want to push wages down and cut benefits and make as much money as possible too. But I'm. I'm not, I'm in, a, a, on that other side, but just as the companies that are part of the chamber have decidedly to collective bar, uh, collectively bargain, the ones that are not part of that collective bargaining, they don't get the same benefit that the chamber gets, and I kind of use that with the uh, kind of union comparison with that. Uh, the other thing is, it, it's kind of going back, it's um, um, unions have a history, and it's a history is diverse as this country is. Sometimes there were good moments there, sometimes there were bad moments. There were moments in, in, in union history where uh, uh, certain organizations were put together to protect certain people, but things have changed now. So a lot of the pushback in the South comes from the <clears throat> rocky history we've had in this country, where there's some people down there who believe that because of one's ethnicity, they don't deserve to make as much money as somebody else. So what a union does, it, it equalizes that. So with the employer that I work for now, and just say Representative Weber was there too, just say that system was still in place, which it still is in, in St. Louis, he could go in with the same qualifications, making more money than myself. And because of the union contract, it equalizes the field. I still have to get in the door, so it's still up to the employer to hire me. But once I'm in the door and we're doing the same thing, our pay is, is levelized. Uh, or equalized, and with that, everybody benefits from that. So from the engineer who's not part of the bargaining unit, everybody benefits from that, that union wage, which is the baseline. Now, would, would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. and uh, I want to uh, make clear a point, and if, if I have not done so previously. Um, the chamber is an organization, and myself as an individual fully recognize the value in uh, collectively bargaining. You want, in some sense, the chamber is just that. We are a group of companies that have got, to better because, got together to work towards a common purpose because we recognize that we can do that better when we band together than we can typically as individuals. So to the extent that you're suggesting that the chamber um, is opposed to the idea of collective bargaining, I would say that that's not true. What we are opposed to is the notion of compulsory com the, of, of compulsory dues paying because I think at the end of the day uh, unions do um, serve a very good purpose that you have outlined extraordinarily well and I appreciate your insight on that representative and all I'm saying is that good unions don't need compulsory dues and bad unions don't deserve them that's all I'm saying and if we pass this law we get rid of that problem and, I, and I'd like to, may, maybe you'll have an analyst working on that, but a list of, of the bad unions, because I don't know uh, of many. But thank you for your question. <laughs> thank you for accepting the question. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Bratton? Just to inquire. Go ahead. To kind of touch on what he's saying, you, you collectively bargain for, for your members, but if you pass something that's, that's statewide that benefits all businesses within the state, that's not uh, saying that, that all businesses within the state are freeloaders. They're just they're they're uh, enjoying uh, the benefits of, of what you've you fought for. We've made the pie bigger. Is right, one way exactly. of saying that. So so to say that the worker that's working right alongside performing the same type of work that, that that worker right next to him because he chooses not to pay dues doesn't make him a bad worker. 
uh, he just thinks that his work and uh, can can uh, speak for itself and, and he can do it himself but his his pay just because they've collectively bargained uh, for that pay uh, it's the same same scenario that uh, he's just reaping uh, the benefit of of that it doesn't make him I guess worse or our freeloader like we keep hearing right and I, I, I think if I understood that I, I think I agree with the representative and, and certainly I, I think the broader point you're driving at is that um, we we all ought to in strive to live in a place where there is room for ideological differences amongst those people who we work with side by side and I think this bill again allows for that eventuality I agree. thank you thank you thank you Jay um, thank you members of the committee Hear from Raymond Hefner, please. Chairman Land, members of the committee, my name is Raymond Hefner. I am a registered lobbyist. I'm here representing the Plumbing Industry Council, the Missouri Association of Plumbing Heating Cooling Contractors, and the Sheet Metal Contractors, St. Louis Chapter. Um, I provided testimony over the years that you've heard more on more than one occasion. Uh, we are simply entering our appearance in opposition to this legislation and i've taken the liberty of sending information to each of your emails for review uh, i just wanted to keep it brief thank you sir representative Gosen. come to our place go ahead now i actually have a question i and i don't know the answer i'm not trying to do a gotcha i'm looking for this answer and i'd be glad anybody that gets up would ask me this i, I wanted to ask this when the electrical guys were up here um, I read their letter, and you know I. Actually, and I have not. Oh, well, it, it's it's pretty easy. I actually I was like 22 years old when uh, a guy in St. Louis who was a friend of mine at Mizzou, uh, name was David Payne, has a little electric company down there now, and uh, he he gave me a talk and told me why being uh, his union representation was so important to him and the family's company at that time. And so I had an early, you know, I had my initial perspective was from someone who felt it was critical for him doing business to, to be a union shop. And I learned a lot of the ins and outs back then. Um, so I don't think I'm coming from a, a, a contrary point of view. But my question is this. In this letter, it talks about all the things like that the electricians, the training they go through, and companies require a lot of this safety training, all this different stuff. Couldn't say right to work was something that passed. Couldn't, wouldn't that be one of the big advantages you, let's say a plumbing contractor would offer to that company, hey, every plumber we send to your place will have gone through all this training. They're gonna have the apprenticeship, they're gonna have everything. And if a member of your company chose not to join the union, they wouldn't have access to that training maybe. And so it would behoove them to be a member of the union so they could get all that training so they could get, go work those jobs again I'm done.